Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope that you have had as wonderful a time as I have had over these last couple of days hearing lots of beautiful and hopeful things, uh, especially when Father Isaac says that God can even make use of, of jackasses. That made me feel very hopeful <laughs> that even I might be of use. Uh, but honestly, the devotions, the Marian devotion, uh, the focus on the Mass, the true understanding of the Mass and the priesthood cannot be stressed enough. And uh, it's wonderful to be among uh, like-minded folks. Uh, I am a convert and uh, 27 years in the desert. And one of the keys to my conversion was uh, coming toward truth through beauty. I would say that I would describe my, my journey in that way. And uh, it was physical beauty. It was uh, artistic beauty. But it is a way to prepare your soul to receive uh, truth. And so that process, to me, was very much tied up with music. And when it was time for me to, to hear the truth, I, was, uh, I had been prepared for it by uh, beautiful music, some of which we'll, we'll hear today. So the piece we're going to talk about is the Misa Pape Marcelli, and that's by Palestrina. So the Prince of Music is a fellow called Palestrina, and difficult to stress how important he is in liturgical polyphony, but we'll get to that a little bit when we talk about his bio. And uh, the really catchy phrase, the mass that saved polyphony, is uh, part of a legend that surrounds the Misa Pape Marcelli, and we'll talk about that as well. And uh, one thing that we have to remember, as a Catholics, we like legends. And uh, sometimes these tales, these apocryphal tales, uh, we lose nothing by believing them. We lose nothing by expanding our understanding by things which are, say, extra historical. So we lose nothing by believing, for instance, that Pope St. Gregory the Great actually heard the Holy Spirit speaking to him from behind a screen when he's transcribing chant. And we lose nothing by believing the, the, the fairly dramatic uh, legend of the uh, Misa Pape Marcelli. So we'll get to that. All right, what's on the menu? Uh, we need to talk a little bit about the historical context of this work. This involves, of course, talking about the Council of Trent. And uh, we're going to be reminded that there's always been crises in the church. Uh, and this is helpful. So a little bit of historical context. We'll talk about the man and the myth involved here. And uh, finally, we will discuss, uh, not in a whole lot of technical detail, but we will, uh, I'll try to have a, a really considered listening of some excerpts from the piece itself. And in fact, uh, rather than uh, give you my own introduction, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of sound. This is the first of two Agnus days that are in this piece. And I want you, close your eyes if you will, but I want you to, to, to put yourself in the space uh, where Palestrina wants you to be. Let's sort of find ourselves uh, back in that uh, high Renaissance polyphony sort of, of, of atmosphere. And so uh, a couple of minutes of Palestrina to start.
That's a sonic cathedral. That is a remarkable space to occupy. And remember, this is the music, obviously a pinnacle, but this is the music that is sufficiently magnificent to serve the Mass. And so we know what the answer is. We know what the solution is. So the question is uh, not so much what to do or where to go, but how to get back, how to get back. So we will uh, try to weave in the themes of the talk. It works pretty well. Standing uh, on borrowed time, standing firm in the faith. So uh, in a way, looking back at history is, is uh, it, in essence, borrowing from time, borrowing lessons from time. So uh, this is the sort of borrowing that we will, uh, we will discuss when we talk historically about uh, this piece. Standing firm implies what? Uh, first of all, that we're not pacing back and forth. We are secure in the most important things. We are secure. We are standing on the, on the bedrock of, of faith. Uh, but it does require that there's something firm to stand on. And I hope that you've been given some encouragement when discussing the Mass, uh, to realize that this is the, this is the bedrock. Uh, this is the ultimate solid ground. And uh, hearing this piece, you will also understand that there is cultural solid ground to stand on as well. If I could make a pitch for you to start uh, incorporating this into your life, uh, the great Renaissance polyphony, I would be, uh, be happy to do that. And I've got a whole long list of these things. If you need uh, suggestions on what to listen to, let me know. We'll get to that. All right, what does history tell us? Uh, history tells us that we've been here before. Uh, the sky may be falling, but it's probably not falling any faster than it always has been falling. Uh, great music allows us a chance to look up and appreciate the beautiful sunset that's happening on the falling sky. Uh, but we need to keep our bearings. We need to keep our bearings. We cannot panic. We must remain uh, confident. We must remain at peace. We must learn from the past so we can stand firm in the present and trust providence to take care of the future. All right? So uh, we have seen the use of, uh, of music as a corrective measure before in history. This also, uh, the popes have used music frequently as a way to teach, as a way to unify, and we'll see that when we talk about music and the papacy briefly. Uh, and yes, these times are different. So uh, are we going to rebuild Christendom by listening to uh, the Samba Mass or listening to the uh, Eagle's Wings or, or Kumbaya? Uh, this is very unlikely. This is not solid ground. This is uh, sand and it's shifty stuff. So uh, what do we do? First of all, we don't panic. Uh, we remember our heritage and we start insisting on it more and more. Uh, your uh, insistence on going to the old mass is insisting on your birthright as a Catholic, insisting on your heritage and giving God his due honor. Uh, I hope you find a place where you can hear music like this song. It still happens. Why? Because this is the setting of the Mass for all times. The Mass hasn't changed. The appropriate music hasn't changed. Uh, we have changed, and yet we haven't. We're still in need of this sort of nourishment. We're still in need of the Mass. We're still in need of great culture. All right, so where are we historically when we talk about Palestrina? We're talking about the Council of Trent, 16th century. Right? So it happens over the course of, of some decades in, in mid-16th century. Palestrina's life is essentially the last uh, three quarters of the uh, 16th century, 1525 to 1595. So Trent closes in 1565. Uh, it tells us that the church has uh, dealt with these crises before. Uh, every age deals with its, its own turbulence, and the Council of Trent was pretty profound. This is the counter-reformation, right? We're dealing with the aftermath of Luther and his band. And uh, it's very interesting. If you've ever read the 95 Theses, anybody ever read those? Uh, yeah, you approach them with great fear and trembling because you think, wow, this document must be epic. It's actually not. It's a crashing bore. There are about three topics involved in the, in the 95 Theses. 
uh, papal infallibility, indulgences, and sort of general abuses, Luther admits not to understanding either papal indulgences or infallibility. So two-thirds of his points are erroneous based on his own admission. And what happens as far as the general complaints about the administration of the church, the church herself takes these up at Trent. Any chance of Luther coming back? Not a chance. He's long gone. Shows that his motives are not strictly theological, certainly not strictly philosophical. There's something ical that they are, uh, but they're, they're not uh, diabolical, you could say. Right? Luther's motivation is curious because the church herself takes corrective measures, and rightly so. This happens in music as well. Uh, things had gotten pretty bad. What do we tend to do as sinful uh, children? We tend to exceed. We tend to bend rules. We tend to break rules. And occasionally, the, uh, the gentle mother has got to, uh, to take some corrective measures. So uh, popes have done this throughout history. Popes have sort of set us back on course. Uh, and they have used music. We think about our, our patrons in, in music, Pope St. Gregory the Great and Gregorian chant. Pope uh, Gregory II with the dissemination of the Schola Cantorum, right? So Gregory II reigns in the eighth century and he sends out his Schola Cantorum to unify, impose Roman chant on the church. Uh, and what happens? Well, he's gone out to these places where there are, are fully developed chant dialects and he curbs some excesses and he imposes a unified approach to chant. So the Gallican chant, the Ambrosian chant, the Mozarabic chant, has anyone ever heard any Mozarabic chant? Fascinating. Mozarabic, it's sort of from southern Spain and it has a sort of exotic feel to it, a North African feel, fascinating stuff. Most of this is gone. Uh, you could argue that the, the loss of these distinct chant dialects is uh, as great an artistic loss as we've ever uh, known about in the history of, of, of music. And yet the church does this in order to preserve unity. So when we get to the legend, and what's the legend when we get to the Council of Trent, that the, the abuses in polyphony are so bad that the Pope's just going to shut it all down. The legend's not so unbelievable. Popes had done things like that before for the sake of unity, to cut out an abuse or a system of abuse so that the focus could remain where it belongs, on the Mass. So uh, Sixtus IV creates the Sistine Chapel and establishes the professional choir in Rome. Uh, Innocent VIII, Alexander VI, these are the patrons of the great composer Josquin. Uh, Julius II, probably most famous for his patronage of Michelangelo, but also he creates the choir of uh, St. Peter's Basilica. So a lot of very important uh, papal musical patrons. All right, so we get to Trent, and what's the problem? The problem is abuse. People are going crazy with this polyphony. It's out of control. How out of control? I'll read you a couple of quotes. Uh, this is from a bishop at the time. His name is Cirillo Franco. And he says, quote, in our times, they have put all their industry and efforts into the composition of fugues, so that one voice says Sanctus, uh, while another says Sabaoth, still another Gloria Tua, with howling, bellowing, and stammering, so that they more nearly resemble cats in January than flowers in May. Uh, it's true, it's cacophony, right? And this bishop is saying that these things have gotten bad. Uh, Grove Dictionary of Music. This is Grove II, which is written in the early 20s, wonderful uh, pompous style. Says this, quote, it is not easy for us to realize now the position of church music at the Council of Trent. Listen closely here. It may be said that it had lost all relation to the services which it was supposed to illustrate. Bristling with inept and distracting artifices, it completely overlaid the situations of the Mass, while founded as it was for the most part upon secular melodies, it was actually sung, except by two or three prominent voices in the front row of the choir, 
to the words to which its tunes were most naturally and properly associated. Did you get that? So they were singing the actual secular tunes with the actual secular words while a couple of guys up front were singing Kyrie and Gloria, etc. It was usual for the sacred text to blend along the aisles of the basilica with the unedifying refrains of the lewd chanson of Flanders and Provence, while ballad and other dance music was played every day upon the organ. It was bad. It was bad. Is it slightly more elevated than uh, today's popular music brought into the church? Well, sure. But the, the concept is there. We are bringing the profane into the temple. This is not a good idea. So the idea that that's, that sprang up from nowhere in 1962 is not exactly true. So the fathers at Trent are dealing with not only a, 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 a liturgical and philosophical mess, they're dealing with a cultural mess as well. So things had to be reined in. So the pope who really makes the tough decisions is Pope St. Pius V. He, of course, gives us the Mass for all time, which cannot, never has been, never will be abrogated. So uh, be at peace about that. That is the Catholic Mass. And uh, in the 22nd session of the Council of Trent, which happens in 1563, a, uh, we hear this on music. Quote, They shall also banish from church all music that contains, whether in the singing or in the organ playing, things that are lascivious or impure. Close quote. That's it. Well, it's all you need to say, but that's it. So banish the, the, the intermingling of the lascivious and the impure, either in singing or in, in, in instrumental playing, and you will have something that you can call liturgical music. Point is, there was a lot of this to be banished. And so here's the myth. Now, this is a, one of many quotes on the, the myth of the Marcellus Mass that saved polyphony. Uh, this comes from 1629, which is many years after the fact. And this is, from what we can tell, about a third-hand account. Quote, Pius V, a most serious-minded pontiff of the church, had noticed for some time that music and singing in sacred places had very little else than an abundance of delicate diminutions and vain adornments. He then determined to set the question of banishing sacred music from the church before the Council of Trent. Then word of this came to the ears of Giovanni Palestrina, and he quickly set himself to compose masses in such a way that all the words should be plainly and clearly understood. When the pontiff heard these works, he changed his mind and determined not to banish sacred music, but to maintain it." Close quote. It's a great story. We lose nothing by choosing to believe it, as it is. And when we hear the work, if the, the bleakest of these rumors were true, the work would have been sufficient to win the day. It's a magnificent piece, absolutely magnificent piece. The question is, would he have done it? Would a pope have done something that dramatic? And I think the, the example of Gregory II tells us that, yes. Uh, again, the loss of fully developed chant dialects that had, that had been coming into existence over the course of seven centuries, if we, if we are willing to cut those out to maintain a unified approach to singing Gregorian chant, not too hard to believe that had the Pope thought it strictly necessary, he would really have trimmed back polyphony to something little more than an elaboration of plain chant. But he didn't. And if we choose to think that the Misa Pape Marcelli was the mass that saved polyphony, all the better for us, because it means that we know it well. All right, Giovanni per Luigi da Palestrina, again, roughly 1625 to 1595. Uh, and again, baptismal records, uh, birth records, it's a little vague. 
but essentially the uh, last three quarters of the, the 16th century. Not uh, 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 aristocratic. He comes from humble beginnings. He is, his uh, musical talent is recognized very early. He shows up in Rome at about the age of 15. And what's rare about Palestrina is that it's clear he's not there for his voice. Almost always, the young men who went to Rome or started as boys, uh, they started as, as choristers. They were great singers. Palestrina, from many accounts, had a fairly bad voice. But he was a, a talented keyboardist and clearly had a knack for composition. So he was tolerated in some pretty high caliber choirs for what else he brought to the table. It wasn't his voice, and this is interesting to realize. A lot of the great uh, Renaissance uh, polyphony composers uh, were beautiful singers before they were composers at all. And they kind of came to composition organically. Joscan's a great example of that. But Palestrina, not necessarily a singer. Uh, in 1554, which has to give us a sense of, this is a young man, yeah. He dedicates a volume of uh, masses to uh, Julian III. This is interesting because it was the first time in, ever that an Italian composer had written something which was worthy to be accepted by a pope. That's hard to believe. But it's true, this was not, uh, Italy was certainly not the, the center of the compositional world at this point. We had just come out of Flanders, for instance. So the, the Flemish masters had dominated things for quite some time. Now it's starting to move to, uh, to Italy. So that's 1554. 1555, there's a bit of a kerfuffle because he is appointed to uh, the private chapel choir of Julian III. And, uh, there's a little bit of problem with that because it's supposed to be a clerical choir, and he's married with four children. Uh, but he's Palestrina, and so the Pope wants him there, and uh, he stays there. He's a, a, a really a lovely man from all accounts. This is a good person, and uh, a tremendously talented composer. Uh, he's removed from this choir by Paul IV, who's a bit of a reformer. And uh, he goes to the latter, and he goes to Mary Major, eventually comes back to, uh, to St. Peter's. Ends up working for, I think, seven popes. So uh, stayed in Rome for quite some time. Uh, Gregory XIII gives him, charges him with the revision of Gregorian chant. Not a lot of people know this about Palestrina, but he was charged essentially with overhauling all of Gregorian chant. And uh, that's a big job, as it turns out. Um, and that holds up until the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when the, uh, the Salem's revision happens. So uh, all of that is working with Palestrina's work comes out of the Council of Trent. A lot of personal loss. He had uh, four sons. Uh, his wife dies. Three of his sons die, two of whom were promising composers in their own right. The remaining son, uh, according to the 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 Grout Dictionary of Music is, quote, wild and worthless, and uh, does nothing to help his father's legacy uh, after his death. Uh, Palestrina remarries a rich widow, uh, but uh, remains uh, pretty much dedicated to the service of the church. And his uh, professional immortality results from something that people call uh, the Palestrina style, which is difficult to pinpoint. What makes a brilliant composer brilliant? What makes Mozart Mozart? Why is Bach just better? Uh, what makes Palestrina's style so distinct? You know it when you hear it. And it is very difficult. We can talk a little bit about technical elements. You can talk about where composers fit in a, in a continuum of stylistic development. But there's just something different about it. It's better. Call it the finger of God. Why not? What is talent? Can you define that for me? Bach said of himself, I worked hard. Anyone who worked as hard as I did would achieve the same results. <laughs> Two statements there. One is true. <laughs> the other is absurd. Yeah, uh, he worked hard. This is true. Uh, I don't care how hard you work. You're not Bach. 
So Palestrina, I don't care how much you want to style. You're not going to have one named after you unless you have a, a sufficient level of a talent, and that's a stunningly high level of talent. This happens because God wills it, not because people work hard. We hope they work hard. We hope they work hard. Anyway, uh, that's his professional immortality. It's just really, really good. Now, what about personal immortality? Now, it's not my job to put anybody in heaven. But here's a wonderful little anecdote about uh, Palestrina. Again, he'd been in Rome for a long time, knew a lot of, of people, many of whom had a first name of Saint. Uh, a good friend of his was a fellow named Saint Philip Neri. And uh, the account goes that almost all of the last 24 hours of Palestrina's life were spent in the company of Saint Philip Neri. And I would imagine that probably puts you in a pretty good place. So that's, that's one of those beautiful little nuggets of history. Uh, can you imagine Palestrina and St. Philip Neri just talking about music? I don't know. What, does, what do these two people speak of? But that's a beautiful little anecdote. All right. The work itself. And again, we're going to keep this relatively light. We'll keep it relatively short. You're going to hear this. We're going to consider this. I want you to, to, to uh, I want this to be on your, on, your, on your playlist. I want this to be a part of your life. Uh, and I want you to uh, start listening more closely. Uh, I want a lot of Renaissance polyphony in your ears. If I can convince you, if this work can convince you uh, to listen better, to be edified by culture, to, uh, to lift yourself higher through the expression and absorption of, of fantastic artistic masterworks, then to me that's just as important as uh, the, the, the fable of this saving the mass, right? Or the saving uh, uh, polyphony at the Council of Trent. Again, if one soul is saved, if one soul is saved, then all the work that all of us do for decades is worth it, right? If you are consoled at one moment in your life because great music is in your ears, if you can recognize that composers are there to help you, to elevate you, to find you where you are in these moments of difficulty and console you, uh, then I have succeeded. I have succeeded uh, through the works of these wonderful composers. Uh, all right, Misa Pape Marcelli, the Marcellus Mass. Who's Marcellus? Uh, Pope Marcellus II reigns for three weeks, uh, 22 days, 21 days, something like that. Uh, April 9th to May the 1st, 1555. So you say, well, Palestrina, he, he served six or seven or eight popes. Well, uh, when popes are reigning for three weeks at a time, they tend to come pretty quickly. Uh, you ever seen that pope chart where you, all the dates from where that, some of them are really shockingly short. Uh, John Paul I is the, the, uh, the, the September pope, is that right? The 30 days or something like that. Uh, this is a three-week pope. So, obviously, the naming it after him is an honorary thing. Uh, I don't know that, that he probably never even met Palestrina while he was in office. I think you're probably just getting your stationary designed and three weeks as pope. I'm not sure that you get to meet all the staff. So, the date of the composition, maybe it's early. Some of the historians would like to put it somewhere around the death of Marcellus. I doubt that very highly. That would make uh, that would make uh, Palestrina a, a man in his mid twenties. It can happen that composers write phenomenal masterworks at a very young age, first thing right out of the gate. Franz Schubert is one of those composers. The the songs that he writes as a teenager are are absolute masterworks. Uh, Felix uh, Mendelssohn writes the overture to the mid, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream at age 17. So it happens. But uh, this sounds an awful lot more like mature Palestrina than young Palestrina. Very likely this happens at, at uh, 62 or 63, a little bit later on in his career. All right, so what is this Palestrina style that we're talking about? Characterized by four marks. And here they are. 
It is a dynamic linear flow, neither rigid nor static. So in other words, forward momentum. Does that mean that it's going quickly? Not necessarily. In fact, it doesn't move quickly. That's one of its marks. It's not a speedboat. It's a tanker. It's epic. And yet it doesn't lack a maneuverability that you would suppose would attend to something which moves slowly and majestically. So there is a sort of epical quality about it, and yet there's a lightness to it as well. But always smoothness of forward momentum. Point number two, there are very few melodic leaps, so it's always moving smoothly. If there are a leap, uh, it, it happens to be a leap, it's countered by stepwise motion in the opposite direction. In other words, if I go up by way of leap, I'm going to go down by way of step. If I go down by way of leap, I'm going to move back upwards by way of step. All again, all of this is to smooth out any indication of a rough edge. Uh, Palestrina, it's very hard to find any corners. It's very hard to rehearse. Who's sung Palestrina in this room? Yeah, okay. Here's, the, here's what happens. You're in, a, you're in a, a rehearsal with Palestrina and somebody makes a mistake. That measures 74. And you say, all right, well, but where are we going to start? We'll just pick up again and we'll start. Well, you can't, you can't, go, by the time you've figured out a seam to try to fit at an entrance, starting from a dead stop, you might as well go back to the beginning because there are no seams. It's absolutely interwoven terms of what we call the counterpoint, the reaction of these the, uh, linear voices working together. It's magical. Uh, but you hope that when you sing it, you're working with a lot of really good readers. <laughs> so, point number three, dissonance. Now, what's a dissonance? Dissonance is a little bit of a clash uh, between voices, mostly harmonically, we think about this. Again, a melody is this linear line of music. A harmony is a sort of a uh, horizontal interplay of multiple voices. Counterpoint is that relationship of managing those multiple voices moving along. Again, this is not a technical seminar. But uh, a dissonance is, a, a, if we had a piano here, we could play some crunchy notes. But there's a little bit of, of, of tension that exists between notes that don't really belong together, quote unquote. And we know that they don't really belong together because they don't really fit well in our ears. So what do you do with a dissonance? You must resolve it, okay? So the use of dissonance can be very effective because you build up a little emotional tension so that you can very uh, satisfyingly relieve it. And Palestrina uses very few dissonances, but if he has them, they are confined to what are called suspensions. That's a wonderful way to build up a little bit of tension. That's that sort of ooh moment where you kind of drive over a little rise and then drop very suddenly off it. Wonderful. Uh, passing notes and what are called weak beats. So translation, the dissonance, if it exists, is always very subtle, never emphasized, always for a purpose. If we build up a little tension, we immediately relieve it. And finally, the Palestrina style is marked by text which is plainly and clearly understood. No cats in May, right? No three or four texts going on at the same time. No people sort of competing with each other for supremacy in terms of who's singing what text. And it, could, it can be crazy. There are some pieces where you've got three or four lines of text happening simultaneously, never in Palestrina, never in Palestrina. Uh, so when we talk about music, there are some, some uh, elements, technical elements, which uh, we will apply to Palestrina that re require just a moment or two of, of, of consideration. One of these things is uh, texture, okay? So the texture of a piece, it can get a little bit obscure. Anyone ever read the back of a wine bottle where they start talking about the, the cheeky insouciance of of uh, 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 ju uh, juvenile berries frolicking with the, the fawn's dew and the, uh, what, it's ridiculous, right? And yet somehow the leather and the smoke and the this and that. 
it, it's it's got nothing to do with with the, with food, and yet somehow the, there's an essential evoking. With music, you start talking about stuff in a similar way. What is texture when it comes to music? What is it? What does it feel like? And oftentimes you'll you'll hear music described as a as a fabric, right? There's a, a kind of a roughness to it. There's a little bit of a tack in the sound, or it's there's a sheen to it. There's a satiny quality to the flow of the counterpoint. And you go, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, there's something to it, though. There's something to it. And Palestrina is a lot about texture. Uh, so again, seemingly contradictory. But the weave is at once very, uh, a lot of voices working together, and yet there's a, a sheer to it which is remarkable. Uh, you can almost see through it at times. Whereas some of this stuff is so dense, it's, it's, it's imposing. Josquin is imposing. Even William Byrd, when he gets five or six voices go, is imposing. Palestrina, you can't sing it, I'm sorry. I mean, it's just really hard, some of this stuff. Uh, but it, there's always an elegance to it, there's always an ease to it, and there's always a sense of diaphanous, magnificent stuff. All right, what about this piece? Let's listen to some of it. So what are we talking about when we talk about a, pol a polyphonic mass setting or a polyphonic mass cycle. Well, you're talking about the setting of the ordinary of the mass, or the common of the mass. These are the parts of the mass that happen every day. Not every day, because if you're in purple, you're not going to sing a Gloria, etc. But this is the Kyrie, this is the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei. Right, these are the common parts of the mass. So a polyphonic mass setting sets the common parts of the mass. And there are different ways to do this, different ways to make this a cohesive thing. A lot of times in the, the early Renaissance, the mid-Renaissance, the, the, uh, even the early Baroque, you would have masses that are called paraphrase masses. Right? They would take a tune, sometimes it was a secular tune, uh, but they would all, the, all these pieces would be related by this, this tune, and it was somebody else. Sometimes the composer's own tune, sometimes somebody else's tune. Uh, this is a what we call a freely composed mass. This is all Palestrina's own melodic material. So freely composed, and uh, talking about this texture business, there are six voices. Okay. When you have uh, the sort of standard four voice construction, S A T B, um, there are uh, there's a certain level of complexity that you can attain. Adding a fifth voice, adding a sixth voice, it's not an incremental increase in potential complexity. It becomes an exponential increase in potential complexity. So there's a lot going on when you add two more voices to that texture. This is a complex work. This is a complex work. So uh, if you are in a, a choir out there, uh, probably not the work to start with. Probably not the work to start with. So this is the sort of leave the heavy lifting to the professionals and why uh, this is not an insult to anybody out there. I don't do this with my choir of 40. Why? Because it's not the choir that sings in the Vatican. <laughs> this is not the finest group of singers in the world. This is the, gr this is the group that Palestrina is writing for. All right, so we have the Kyrie, which is actually in three sections. We have the Kyrie, the Christe, and the Kyrie. We're going to start with that. So the Kyrie one, uh, this is about uh, adoration. And I'm going to describe the opening of this piece. You tell me if you agree. As uh, a daybreak moment. Uh, who's, who's ever seen the sun rise over the mountains? Isn't that a magnificent thing? Where that first light just sort of, and then all of a sudden it fills the sky. You are aware not only of majesty, but there is an undeniable sense of what I will call altitude. Again, here we're talking in non-musical terms about music. But there's something about this which makes you feel as if you are looking down on the world from about 30,000 feet. 
That's the Palestrina thing, very difficult to describe. But you're just sort of up there, okay? So we hear the Kyrie. This warms up a little bit through the middle. Again, just like a sunrise. You'll hear the lower voice comes in, starts to fill out the texture underneath. Uh, and then we end with a very standard, what we'll call plagal cadence. This is the Amen cadence. So this is the Kyrie one. Again, we're looking to save polyphony. This is a good place to start. sure if that was going to go on or not. It will, so I'm going to stop it. If that had been the entirety of the piece, I, I would argue that would have been enough to save polyphony. That is a, an, an element of, I mean, that's artistic perfection. Uh, artists are pretty good, and a lot of times uh, the masters do a pretty good job. This is, that's perfect. That's a, that's a moment of artistic perfection. Absolutely incredible. Now that's complete unto itself. What happens on the Christe? This is a more it's more of a supplication. Uh, he thins out the texture so it sounds by pushing the emphasis up into the top uh, three or four voices in this case. And so we have a sense that it's a little bit thinner, a little more intimate, okay? The, he, he, uh, the, the, the breathtaker moment in this movement, listen for the repeated descending emphasis of the word Christe. And at the end, he'll use what we call a half cadence, which makes it impossible to stop. You have to move on uh, at this half cadence. All right, this is the Christe. I'm not, do I need to rate the app? All right, I'm not going to rate it. No, thanks. Don't you love technology? All right, Christe Laison. Different texture, a sense of supplication. Listen for those descending, repeated Christes and the cadence that says, we're not stopping here. <laughs>
So you hear in that final cadence, that very last note, he's forcing us to move forward. I, again, it, it's, you can only speak of the piece in superlatives, but always remember that this is meant to serve the Mass. This is the handmaid of the Mass. And so even though it's magnificent, it is still in sufficient proportion to what's going on at the Mass. Now, interesting side note, a piece like this is not appropriate in every space. And we're talking about St. Peter's Basilica here. I could not do this uh, in my chapel, uh, at least not the current one. Uh, firstly, because I don't think choir could handle it, but secondly, the space is too small. So uh, you have too much music in the Mass if there has to be a sort of pause in the, in the, the, the drama of the liturgy in order to, to wait and listen for the music. Uh, I sing uh, 120 Masses a year uh, in St. Mary's, with, with Sunday Masses, with, with first class feasts, second class feasts, holy days, weddings, funerals, probably about 120 Masses a year. And you're continually watching to make sure that the priest doesn't have to stop things to wait for the music. You cannot stop the action of the liturgy for the sake of I don't, music, I don't care how glorious it is. And some priests like music better than others. Sometimes they'll wait for the cadence, uh, and sometimes they won't. <laughs> but ultimately, you are there to serve the Mass. There to serve the Mass. Um, all right. Last curiae. Now, we're not going to listen to the whole Mass. We're going to listen to bits of the Gloria and bits of the Credo. Uh, but we'll spend some time with the outer movements. So this is the last Kyrie, again a change in mood. There's a lot of joy here, there's a lot of sort of ebullience, even though we're still singing Kyrie. Uh, but it proceeds directly from the final cadence and uh, a real triumph at the end to wrap up the Kyrie. Second Kyrie, end of the Kyrie section. text. How many words are there in the entire Kyrie Christa? It's six words. Okay, So he's not going to prove to you that particular point of his style on this movement. And in fact, he can be a little bit more elaborate in what we call uh, the counterpoint. So when we get to the Gloria and the Credo, and this is true of chant, it's true of polyphony, you've got to move a lot of text through. And so when you talk of chant, there's a difference between uh, what's called the pneumatic or the melismatic setting of the outer movements, which have relatively small amounts of text, and the uh, syllabic setting, necessarily note for note, note for syllable setting of the big text, just because you've got to move through it. Uh, how does Palestrina demonstrate that with a change in, in this business of texture? Instead of all of these overlapping, interweaving lines, you have what's called a homophonic texture where you hear the text very clearly and all of the voices are singing in the same rhythm at the same time. So a little bit 
of the Gloria, a little bit of the Credo, and you will see when you go back and listen to the whole thing, which of course you will on your drive home tonight, uh, that the effects that he makes, he does a, a lot of what we like to call word painting. So specific effects on specific words, uh, either dynamically or harmonically, changes in mood, major, minor, happy, sad, uh, or using speed or dynamics to make the point. All right. So the opening of the Gloria, beautiful homophonic texture, everyone moving at the same time, and dynamic contrasts will be based on the text. The first uh, full entrance of all six voices happens on the first repeated text. This is on Domine Fili Unigenite Jesu Christe. Uh, big change at the Quitolis Peccata Mundi, uh, totally different mood, much more reflective. And uh, then in the Gloria Dei Patris, Amen, you will hear uh, him anticipate the uh, Venetian style by about 30 years. He'll use a cadence that Gabriele uses all the time, but he's doing it 30 years before Gabriele does. So bits of the Gloria, we've got about two minutes of this. Listen to these sections, listen to these uh, distinct elements. Gloria. Isaac. See how clear that text is. See how clear that text is. Change in mood, qui tolis peccata mundi. Much more reflective. Here we have some of those suspensions that we're talking about. That little bit of tension. It's talking about sins. Skip ahead to the big finish, and if you know your Gabrielli, you're going to hear what he looks like. It's a minor uh, music dork point, uh, but Gabriele gets credit for that cadence, and Palestrina is doing it 30 years before he does. All right, on to the credo. Again, these are about eight minutes long, these big internal movements, and we're going to hear just a couple of minutes spliced in and out. A couple of things to listen uh, for here. It begins with a real flourish. You will hear this forward momentum again, getting through a lot of text. Uh, very interesting harmonic moment that happens at Filium Dei Unigenitum. He goes back to a medieval uh, harmony. Uh, so he goes back to a Landini cadence. I'm not exactly sure why. So all of these little touches, all these little details, something about the text triggers these moments where he changes. He, he's going back and forth uh, across multiple centuries in terms of some of the harmonies he's using. And all of it specifically aligned to text, that would be a great puzzle to unravel. 
a lot of this is very modern, uh, very forward-looking harmony. You could describe this, and this is again mid. Uh, 1500s, you could describe this as, as modern harmony in a lot of places. He's anticipating some uh, a use of uh, what we would call tonal harmony uh, that is probably about 50 years ahead of its time. Remarkable piece, not only just the sound of it, but technically as well. A lot going on. All right. The last thing we will, we will contemplate is what happens at the et incarnatus est which, for my money, might be the best part of any polyphonic mass. Obviously, these composers, co composers know what's going on theologically, and they always take exquisite care with that bit of text. Never has anyone taken more care than Palestrina does here. All right, bits of the credo. Come taking us back in time 200 years with that that cadence again a little detail here we are times when God just wants to spend some time alone with his mother. It's just amazing. And we, we, we consider the incarnation in so many ways, but one of the most wonderful is the intimacy uh, that, I, why did God choose to come into the world uh, in a stable, in poverty, in silence, in isolation? Well, Maybe part of it has to do with the fact that he just wanted to have a little alone time with his mother. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And composers invariably will really treat that moment with great delicacy. Uh, again, it's just an amazing uh, example of that here from Palestrina. All right, we are at the Sanctus. So immediately... We are back to the style of the Kyrie. We're back to that sort of cruising altitude of the Kyrie. Another great moment in most uh, polyphonic masses, the opening of the Sanctus. Remember, this is the text that the angels are singing all the time in heaven. Can we don't, uh, why is music the greatest art? We know this as a fact because uh, it's the only art that exists in heaven. We know singing. They're singing all the time in heaven. There's no painting in heaven. There's no sculpture in heaven. No one's writing poems in heaven. They're singing all the time. All the time they're singing. And what are they singing? Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. Okay? So another special moment in almost every polyphonic mass. This is Palestrina's. And a couple of things to, uh, to, to focus on. Uh, the, all of these points, remember, we'll go back to this business of uh, the Palestrina style, dynamic linear flow, few melodic leaps, any leaps there are countered by stepwise motion in the opposite direction, 
any dissidents, very quickly resolved, and uh, confined to suspensions or passing notes. Not going to be a lot of that here. And text plainly and clearly understood. All right. Here's the song series. So That's the first phrase. <laughs> Only play two phrases of the Sanctus and Benedictus. Here's the Benedictus.
there are things that are just plain beautiful. Uh, there are things that are uh, breathtakingly beautiful. And then there are things like that which are actually what I would call achingly beautiful. There are moments in there which almost hurt. We have, I'm afraid, uh, a limited capacity to appreciate uh, beauty. And certain composers will take us right up to that, that line. And we make the mistake of thinking that we can handle more of it than we probably actually can. And so composers do us a favor by not giving us as much as we want. It's a bit of a tease for the upcoming Agnus Day 2, uh, where Palestrina gives us a glimpse really behind the veil. Uh, Mozart will do this every now and then. He'll give you a few seconds of music, which is so remarkably beautiful that you just want to stay there forever. But you can't. It would render you incapable of doing anything else. You'd become a useless human being. You'd be floating around, uh, overtaken by this beauty. But it's nice to be given a glimpse. So as remarkable as that is, uh, when we talk about the, and, and we've made it, this is the end. This is the Agnus Day number two. We already heard Agnus Day number one. That's how we opened. And I hope it's loud enough out there. It sounds a little quiet to me up here, but uh, if you can hear it where you are, great. Um, but again, I don't worry so much about this because I know you're going to go out and listen to it uh, immediately uh, as soon as this is... Uh, but be careful. Don't get so distracted that you drive off the road or anything, right? I don't want anyone tumbling down Snoqualmie Pass because uh, they're just in rapture. Uh, so, we get to the second of the two unused days. Uh, he devotes a separate unused day to each of the two phrases in the piece, in the, te in the text. Remember, you have unused day, quitele spiegata mundi, miserere nobis. That's the text of unused day number one. The text of unused day number two, unused day, quitele spiegata mundi, dona nobis pacem. And don't think he's not going to let that slip by without making some... Uh, notice of it. It's a remarkable thing. There is an entrance, and it depends on what score you're using. Not that I've counted, but it's either in measure, measure 89 or measure 35. And it is an entrance of the first soprano, an ascending entrance of the first soprano on a, on a Dona Nobis Pacem, which defies description. And it's fleeting, and it's heavenly. He's trying to tell you something. Uh, what else about this? Well, we started out with six voices. Uh, we've got to have seven for this piece. So he adds a voice. And he takes the texture and he pushes it up in terms of, of uh, the, the, the voices. It's been uh, S-A-T-T-B-B -B most of the time. So soprano, alto, two tenors, which is basically an alto and a tenor and then a baritone and a bass. So it's actually been, if you can believe it, a little bottom heavy in terms of the texture. For the second on you stay, we have two sopranos, we have two altos, uh, a tenor and two basses. So he's taken the whole texture and moved everything up. So we've got even more altitude here. Why the extra voices? He, composers do this, some, artists do this sometimes. They leave uh, secrets there for people to find. Uh, and I don't know how long it took for somebody to find this. But uh, there is what I'd like to call, uh, in this piece, uh, platinum rebar. So in other words, this is a reinforcing element of, of surpassing quality and value. So embedded in this piece, three of the voices are singing, for no particular reason, a canon. At three measure intervals, that means that one voice starts, three measures later, another of the three voices starts at a different pitch level, but exactly the same melody, in exactly the same meter, exactly the same rhythm, and then three voices later, the third voice starts, and they do that throughout the entire movement for no particular reason. The other four voices are doing their own thing, and you cannot hear it. You can only see it and you can only see it if you happen to be looking for it, and there's no reason why you would look for it. It's just in there. It's a moment of artistic excess. 
And yet, because this is not a modern man, this is still a man of faith, he's not doing it to draw attention to himself. It's a great metaphor here in this. But what a remarkable detail. You can't hear it. I can't hear it. Even when you're looking at the score, you can't really hear it. But it's there. It's there. All right. Let's see if we can handle this. Don't count, but it's in two, and at measure 35, good luck. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Another moment of unbelievable, and this time unbearably poignant intimacy 
that God shares with his own mother. What do you suppose happened for the hours following the resurrection? Where do we know Christ went? To console his mother. And he didn't just drop by. Do you think that she's going to let anything happen to the Mass? Do you think she's going to let the devil win this fight? It is so hard. It is so frustrating. When you love the Mass, when you love our Lord, when you love Our Lady, it is so frustrating to see the abuse, to hear the insults. How many times have you heard this weekend, though? No slave is greater than the master. If God endured the scorn and the bile and the insults, we can't expect that we're going to get away without having to endure the same. So part of our cross, again, as Father Isaac told us, reminded us, the great beam of our cross is ourselves. But the cross beam, at least part of it, is having to carry Christ's cross with him as his church goes through her agony. But we know what the Mass looks like. You assisted at it this weekend. Don't give that up. Even if it's has some inconvenience to you, find that Mass. Now you know what, what that Mass deserves in terms of musical clothing. This is what that Mass sounds like. And we know the spaces that are fit to serve that Mass. And someday, they will all be ours again. We can't be less patient than God. Cling to her, yes. Hide behind her, absolutely. Go to her at all times, run to mommy. Run to mommy. Uh, yeah, that's the Mass that saved polyphony. What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> uh, thank you again for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And I hope this whets your appetite a little bit. This is our heritage. This is our heritage. Thank you again.